Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm Alex Nicol from Arista Networks. So in this session, what I was going to talk about was really, uh, obviously, Arista is a data center company. But looking at how we have seen the evolution of VXLAN uh, from its initial use case within the data center to now we're seeing it used as a VPN technology, layer, building layer two, layer three VPNs, but also how it can then be used to actually build multi-hop, loop-free, layer two networks. So for example, we're seeing it now being deployed uh, inside an, as an IXP infrastructure. Before I go into the details of uh, VXLAN itself, it's probably worth understanding where it actually evolved from within the DC, DC because there's a lot of technologies, approaches within the DC itself that can actually be used when you actually go to deploy VXLAN outside the DC, right? whether it be a VPN or whether it even be building a, an IXP. So if, if you're not already familiar, in, when you talk about next generation data center, it's very much a layer three infrastructure. Okay, a layer three, what we term as a layer three leaf spine architecture, where you have what's termed as a leaf, or top of the rack, depending on what terminology you want to use, and that top of the rack switch then connects to the spine. Okay, and provides some level of resiliency, you will have multiple spines. So in this case, I've got four spines. And the point being here is that the leaf connects to each of those spines. Now, one of the big adoptions here is the fact that that connection between that leaf and the spine is layer three. Okay. And again, if you look at where is the standard going, obviously you're, you're up to your own choice, your own preference, what, what, what routing protocol you use, but we're seeing more and more the adoption of BGP. And more specifically, the benefits of actually running eBGP between that leaf and that spine. Okay, now, just so if it's not clear in the diagram, when we talk about eBGP, what we're running here is actually the BGP session on the physical interface. So the simple benefit of that is I don't have to tweak any timers, the physical link goes down, the BGP session goes down, the routes get removed, so you have fast failover. So the point being here is I've got a lot of control and can provide a lot of scale without doing any routing churn in the network. Now, to make use of the bandwidth, you're then using ECMP. Okay, so now if you look at this perspective of the leaf, the leaf's going to learn all the prefixes and it's going to learn a next talk for those prefixes via each of the spines. So therefore, I've got a four-way ECMP in this, this design. So I'm going to do classic four tuple hashing across those links to get my bandwidth. All right. Now, with that design and that approach becoming more and more prevalent, what we're seeing then is some optimizations and some benefits and trying to solve some of the resiliency aspects of an ECMP design, how you actually can do upgrading of network as well. Now, an obvious one is when we do look at things like ECMP, a classic problem with ECMP is it's, uh, some sort of, uh, it's based on how many next hops that there are. So therefore, if I have a link failure, I'm going to have to rehash everything over my three remaining next hops. Right? So therefore, single link failure, all the traffic's affected. When you look at some uh, resilient ECMP, what you're now doing is you're keeping your next hop count static. Okay? So in this case, the diagram here, instead of having, I have eight next hops, that eight value does not change. Therefore, when a link fails, I don't have to rehash all the flows. I only have to rehash the flows that were going over the fail link. Okay, no, no, the, the, the traffic got over the fail links, just simply now it gets rehashed over the remaining links. So the, the disruption has now been minimized, right? Another nice uh, adoption is this idea, again, from a data center perspective, and this is also used, we've seen it used in IXPs as well, is when you actually want to exit the data center itself. So you might very well be peering out your data center, and you might have two peering connections at different speeds. Could be one gig, the other peering connection at 10 gig. So what you can actually use is, given the fact that you're using BGP here, you can actually use uh, link bandwidth communities to actually steer the traffic and load balance the traffic, and what we term is unequal cost multipathing. So what you're doing here is you're announcing your prefix, and with your prefix, you're going to announce a bandwidth associated with it. You announce that down to the leaf. At the leaf point, he now has a multi-equal cost multipath, but he has different bandwidth to each of those next hops. So therefore, instead of doing a 50-50 load balancing, he can now ba load balance based on the bandwidth he's receiving. Okay, so therefore, in this case, a tenth of the traffic would go via the 10 gig link, a ninth of the traffic would go via the 10 gig link. Okay, again, this is flow based, but the point being is now I'm taking into account what I have in my upstream links. Very useful 
from a, obviously, when you're also transitioning from 100, 1 gig connection, 10 gig connections to 100 gig connection, right? Because you still make use of all those links, but at the same time, load balance based on the bandwidth of the links. And this is kind of where you see some of the benefits of this least spine as well in terms of the approach to resiliency. So inst instead of the old model where you had a three-tiered model where you would have your core network and then to provide resiliency in your core, you would look at dual supervisors, you look at some sort of proprietary ISSU mechanism. With the least spine architecture, the logic here is you're now providing node-level redundancy. So the point being here is, if I look at this from a four-spine perspective, if I lose a single spine, I'm only losing potentially 25% of my bandwidth. All right. So what I can then do is make use of the fact that I'm using BGP to actually gracefully remove the switches from the network, drain traffic off it using things like G-Shirt community, drain the traffic off the, off the switch that I want it to be in maintenance, upgrade it, so I'm not deploying any ISU technology, so therefore I'm not tied to that. I can upgrade it and then reintroduce it back into the network. All right. Well, I'm actually taking the box offline, the point being here is I don't have a single point of failure. Right. I still have three switches still up and remaining. Now, given that adoption of that layer three topology, right, there still is a fundamental requirement within the DC itself to stretch layer two. Right? And this is where the whole idea and the drive between VXLAN came about. Right? But the point with VXLAN was to actually, how do we develop an encapsulation method to make use of that ECMP environment? Right? We didn't certainly want to develop an encapsulation method, but we're going to have to then redesign the entire network. So VXLAN itself, it's now a defined standard. What's interesting about the standard itself is it's not just been driven or has been driven just from a networking vendor's perspective. There's been a mix of application vendors, so VMware are involved in it, networking vendors are involved in it, so Cisco, Arista are involved, but also the chip vendors are involved in it. So what that means as a user means that you're seeing now, by default, any merchant silicon that's coming to the market has VX encapsulation and hardware. Right, so it allows you to adopt the VXLAN and get all the bandwidth benefits you get out of Merchant Silicon. And what it simply is, is a MAC and IP encapsulation. Right? So the, the, the logic being, if I use a MAC IP encapsulation, then I can use this Layer 3 environment. Okay? And what I can then do is transport my Layer 2 network across that Layer 3 environment we just discussed. How that, how that all works is kind of introduce a couple of terminologies. You have what's termed as a VTAB, or VTEB, you want to call it, and that's where the encapsulation happens. That's happening at the edge of the network. So that's when I'm going to take my packet, my Ethernet packet, and I'm going to wrap it around with an IP header, UDP, and then the VXLAN header. In the VXLAN header, I have a field of what's called the VNI, 24 bits. And the point being now, instead of the old VLAN tag being 12 bits, you now have 24 bits. The 24 bits allows me to identify potentially up to 16 million different layer two domains in the network, so it allows you to scale. And then there's the VTI. So the VTI is really what will come in more relevant when you look at the packet itself, but what you're doing here, the VTI is then going to be the source IP address of the outer frame. So the frame itself, I'm going to go through it, because the picture covers most of it. The point being here is I'm going to take the whole Ethernet frame and wrap it inside, first of all, a VXLAN header, and then the VXLAN header, I'm going to have my layer two domain identifier. I'm then going to wrap it inside UDP, and we'll talk a little bit about why, what UDP was picked. And then you have the source and destination IP address, which would be the VTAB that's doing the encapsulation, and the destination VTAB that's doing the, the decap. And then the packet then simply gets routed across that IP infrastructure. So therefore, source MAC and destination MAC, in this case, would be your next hop. The reason why UDP was used was to make use of the, to provide some level of entropy in the packet. So what that means is the source, the destination port is predefined, obviously, but the source port of the UDP packet would actually be, is actually a hash of the inner packet, right? Now again, depending on the chip vendor, that could be just the Ethernet frame, or it could be the Ethernet, the inner Ethernet, and then their IP. So now, by the source port being generated via hash of the, 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 the encapsulated frame, I should say, now you have entropy, entropy when you do your ECMP. What's interesting here is there's not a change in terms of your services model. So the way this works is the standard doesn't define this, but the way it's deployed by or implemented by most vendors is that you can either do a simple 
I take my VLAN in, so my one q tag, and I simply map that to my overlay VNI. Right? So what's termed at the top here, a one-to-one -one mapping. I map my VLAN ID to my VNI. What's really interesting here is the VLAN ID is not actually transported in the packet. So the, v, the mapping itself is significant, local, only locally significant to the VTAB. You can do Q and Q encapsulation, so I can take the S tag, based on the S tag, map it to a particular layer two domain, and then just carry all the C tags in the same layer two domain. And then you have what's, what we term as end to one mapping, right? So this is this idea of taking multiple, certainly relevant in an IXP environment, where you have your partners coming in in different VLAN tags. What you can then do is merge them into a single VNI. Okay, so therefore, different they come in in different VLAN tags, you merge them in layer two domain, and they can peer across that, that shared layer two domain. What, it, what that does mean is, because everything, there's no change in terms of the VLAN construct, security doesn't change, you can use your standard layer two ACLs to do any sort of port level security or Mac level security. And if you want to do any broadcast limiting, right, again, exactly the same as you would do today. So those constructs and those operational models don't change. Now, when you look at the VXLAN standard, where it becomes interesting is a lot of the focus is purely on the encapsulation, right? How do, what's the packet going to look like? Because if you imagine we've got those hardware vendors involved, they want to know what, how they're going to build the silicon, so they have to know what the encapsulation is. So a lot, of the, a lot of the focus of the standard was on the encapsulation, right? The formats of the field and such like. There is a definition within the standard regarding a control plane, but it's really just a flood and learn control plane. Right? And what it actually recommends is what's termed as the a VXLAN multicast control plane. So what that means is if I have any unknown traffic, I simply take that unknown traffic, I wrap it around a VXLAN frame, and the destination IP address in this case would be an IP multicast. The IP multicast then gets flooded using the IP multicast in the underlay to all the VTABs that are interested. Now, there's been very little adoption of that, just simply the fact that people don't want to use IP multicast in their underlay, the concerns about scaling, because you can imagine I'm going to have a different multicast group per layer two domain, so therefore I'm going to generate a lot of state in my network. So the two options on the right-hand side are more the adopted standards, and they have their benefits, swings and roundabouts in terms of simplicity to a level of control. So the most obvious one is head-end replication. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then from an interoperable perspective, you may then have the EVPN model, where you're using BGP control plane to do your upgrade, do your announcements. So let's look at the, the simplest one is what we term as head-end replication. So again, it's a flood and learn model, but the point being here is now I'm removing the requirement for a multicast in the underlay. So what's simply happening here is I'm going to have to manually provision, or I can do it via an API calls, or whatever. I provision, obviously, my layer two domain, and what I have to then provision is which VTABs, which remote VTABs are part of that layer two domain. So that's what's termed as my flood list. When I receive an unknown packet, I simply then take that packet, I then replicate it, unicast it, individually to each of the VTABs that are in the flood list. The remote end then simply learns the, receives the packet. It obviously does a de-encapsulation. And from the de-encapsulation, it can then map the source VTAB the packet came from with the inner source MAC to then learn the MAC address itself. Right, so hence, it's a flood and learner. There's no control plane, it was just flooding and learning. The point with this approach here now is, I don't need any multicast in the underlay. And just to highlight, I mean, how simple this is, and this is kind of one of the main, major benefits of this approach, right? I mean, the config of this is very, very light. Right? This is the full config from a VXLAN perspective. Plus, what's highlighted in the green is just a simple couple of lines of who my flood list is, right? So I'm going to create a flood list. I can create a flood list for my entire domains and share it across all my domains, or I can create a flood list per VNI, right? So the benefit we're seeing with this approach, especially from an IX small to medium-sized IXPs, is they're using this approach, right? Because there's very little overhead, very easy to automate my API calls. Probably where there is a lot of more interest is the whole approach with EVPN, where you're now looking at a BGP-based control plane to actually do the, the discovery and the announcements of what you're learning. Right. So 
So when we talk about uh, eVPN, it's, it's actually a defined standard. So RFC 7432, right? And in the standard, it combines two things. It combines the control plane, so the BGP control plane. And what it also defines in that standard is the forwarding plane. And in this case, in the standard itself, the forwarding plane is MPLS. Right. <coughs> and what, we, what you're defining in there is a new address family for BGP. And then the ability to announce within BGP, not just IP addresses, but IP address and MAC bindings and IP prefixes. Subsequently to that, there are then a number of drafts. And we talk about drafts, people, vendors are now, and Arista's one of them have actually implemented them. So you have a draft which then takes that control plane and uses it in relation to what's called NVO. So this is a data center type solution. So NVO then talks about VXLAN encapsulation, MVGRE encapsulation, and MPLS over GRE encapsulation. All right, so that's the NVO draft. And then there's also one that's more focused on the Metro, which uses uh, PBB. So what I'm going to talk about here is really eVPN in relation to a VXLAN, right? But the control plane, the routes types, very similar across the different forwarding planes, right? It's the exact same concept. So again, quick, we're going to talk about terminology. What you're talking about in terminology, in standard of the standards, NVO, it talks about NVE, but an NVE from a VXLAN perspective is just the same concept we talked about a minute ago, which is a VTAP. Your VP, eVPN instance is your layer two domain, your, your logical switch you're going to build across your, your multiple VTABs that are joining in the same layer two domain. And this is where a lot of people are seeing the value in the eVPN, right? Is because you can now define with eVPN what's called a Mac VRF. So this allows you to build layer two VPNs. And you can also define an IP VRF, which allows you to actually uh, define layer three VPNs as well. Another nice feature within eVPN is the idea you can actually now do dual homing. So when you're doing a layer 2 VPN circuit, you can actually have two VTABs acting as one logical one. And therefore, downstream, you just connect to it via a standard lag. Okay? And when you're doing that, and you're, those two, two devices are sharing that, that segment, that's what's called an ESI. Right? That's a shared Ethernet segment that they're both connected to. So the standard then, as you would expect, defines a new address family for eVPN. What's interesting about it is it just uses everything we're probably already used to from an IPVPN construct. Right? So to give you the multi-tenancy support overlapping IP addresses, overlapping MAC addresses required, you're using root distinguishers and root targets within each of the routes. Right? And then what it actually defines to actually operate, we'll actually hear this conversation, we talk about uh, Vendors are they supporting eVPN. It's very, you should not just look at the supporting eVPN, but actually look at what root types are actually supporting. So the standard itself defines four root types, one, two, three, and four. There's then a, a draft standard, which actually defines root type five, which is a prefix. And what root types you're going to be able to support is going to define what functionality you can define, you actually deliver using eVPN. So just kind of get quick, I've kind of mapped these uh, root types to really what type of service you're looking to deliver. You can, and you can bundle them together. So when we talk, when you talk uh, vendors talking about root type one, or talking about root, uh, root type one and root type four, what they're talking about is supporting the ability to support that multi-homing feature I talked about, right? So if you're not supporting multi-homing, you don't need to support a root type one or root type four. Root type two is the kind of a really important one. So root type two, is a route where it has the ability now to announce via that eVPN route is the MAC you're learning. You're going to announce that MAC, you're going to announce it with the root target, you're going to announce it with the root distinguisher. You also have the option to announce the MAC and also the host IP address as well. Right? And that, as you can imagine, in a layer two environment, that can be a great benefit with the remote device. Now, it not only has the MAC binding, but also has the IEP binding. So therefore, it can do some level of ARP suppression. It can do ARP, ARP proxy at the remote end. Type 5 is now announcing, instead of announcing MACs or host IPs, you're actually just announcing an IP prefix. So therefore, by announcing an IP prefix, 
as I pointed out here, the use case, this allows you to actually use it purely to build layer 3 VPNs as well. So if you're looking at layer 2 VPNs, we're talking about type 2 routes. If you're looking at purely layer 3 VPNs, we're talking about type 5 routes. So how does this all work? So what I've kind of laid this out very much because the conversation is around building layer 2 VPNs, but the, the functionality is very similar when we talk about layer 3 VPNs. How does this work to build multi-point layer 2 environments? So if we take the left-hand side and the traffic flow from the left-hand side to the right-hand side is, you're going to connect to your VTAB, which is going to do the encapsulation. You'll connect to that via layer 2, obviously. And that connection would be normally a VLAN handoff. And with the VLAN handoff, you can then use the service, whether it be one-to-one -one mapping between the VLAN and the VNI, to map that traffic into a particular VNI. At that point in time, what you actually do on the switch, or the VTAB itself, you actually map it into the tenant's MAC VRF. Right. You're going to find a MAC VRF, and in the MAC VRF, you're going to have to configure a root target and a root distinguisher. As soon as I learn that MAC address, I then take that MAC address and I then build my root, my type 2 root. And I'm going to announce it to all my BGP peers. All right. And in the root, as you would expect, you've got the MAC address. If you're doing any host snooping, it would be the IP address. Root target, root distinguisher, I'll have the label in it. So in this case, if I'm using VXLAN, it's going to be my VNI to identify what layer 2 domain it comes from. And I have a next hop on it. And the next hop in this case would be the, IP, or the look back IP address of the VTAB where the packets land. That then gets announced via uh, BGP across to all of my VTABs that are interested. They then learn the MAC address and learn the MAC address and associate it with the next hop that they learned it from. Which therefore means when they go to encapsulate the packet with that VXLAN header, they're going to have a destination IP address, which would be the next hop. The packet then can go through that ECMP network we discussed. Given it's VXLAN, I've got entropy in the packet, so I can actually load balance the different packets across different links with ECMP. Now, EVPN does add, add some extra value in terms of when you talk about layer two. There's sequence numbers in the max. So we do do a layer, layer two, uh, type two. If it moves to a new host, or sorry, the host moves or whatever, or the MAC moves, when you do re-announce it, you're going to re-announce it with a, a new, an updated sequence number. The point of that being is anybody who now receives the newer sequence number, he simply learns it as that's the new destination and flushes out any old information. So it allows you to quickly re refresh all the MAC tables across your layer two domain very quickly. There's also built into it is MAC address dampening as well. So what that means is if I'm seeing MAC address flapping between two different VTABs, as soon as I learn a MAC address, I start a counter. I think the, the, the default, I think it said here is 180 seconds. If I see that MAC moving or being relearned or re-announced somewhere else five times within that 180 second window, I stop uh, announcing it. Right. So again, very useful tools when we start talking about scaling layer two domains. And then thirdly is this concept of multi-homing. Right, so the, the point, the multi-homing is not like we're kind of used to in terms of a sort of MC lag or VPC type technology. technology. With the multi-homing, you actually have the capability of having two VTABs don't need to be interconnected to each other. They can act, work in active standby, active active. And thirdly, you're not limited just having two. Right, you can have three, four, as, as, get as complicated as you wish. The point being is there's no interconnection link between the two of them. They automatically discover each other, what shared Ethernet segment they're, they're connected to, via those type 1 and type 4 routes we discussed. Okay, so that becomes a, another benefit when we talk about building layer 2 environments. So just to give you an idea, what, what does this all look like? And I'm kind of putting this up here just to kind of compare it to, I would say this is slightly more complex, but it depends what your experience is. But certainly more complex in terms of the head-end verification model. Because now, what you're going to have to configure, and this is just a layer 2 VPN model, what you're going to now have to configure is the MAC VRFs. For each time you create a layer 2 domain, you're going to have to create a MAC VRF. And in that MAC VRF, you're going to have to then create, configure your root distinguishers across each of your VTABs. 
you're going to have to then configure your root targets as well. Okay. Once you've done that and you've created your BGP session between all your different peers, you'll automatically learn any MAC address that's learned any NAV, NAV, sorry, any NAV tab that's part of the same VNI as you, or same MAC VRF as you. Right. So the kind of argument here is really EVPN does solve and does provide a lot of uh, benefit, but it's whether the complexity and the overhead of the config over something like head identification, if it's just a small layer two network you're building, actually provides any value to you. Right. So again, if you look at our customer deployments, some of them are using head identification because it's like the lean, very simple to configure. If they're scaling it out, then they see EVPN is a, is a value to them. And again, just, just from a reference point, what does this all look like when you try to troubleshoot this? So this is, this is showing you, this is actually a type two root at the top here in the routing table. And it's actually a type two root. And what I'm announcing the type two root is not just the MAC address, but as I say, the optional one also announcing the IP address in as well. Well, as you can see, MAC IP, it's my next hop, which would be the remote VTAB sitting over here. And in there I have my root targets, I have the encapsulation method that's going to be used, so VXLAN in our case. And I have then the label that's going to be used inside the VXLAN packet. Right. You can see how quickly how, how this root model can be easily transposed into an MPLS environment as well, right? So you would have to change your tunnel type and then the label here would be an M, some sort of MPLS label. And then from the routing from the Mac table perspective, what you simply get is a Mac and then the next hop for that Mac, right? Which is going to be the outer destination IP address for the packet. Okay, I think I'm just about on time. So just kind of summarize, summarize things up. So kind of the benefits we are seeing with the VXLAN is very simple protocol. It's now been adopted uh, across multiple pieces of merchant silicon hardware. And it can do no, I've just talked about VXLAN uh, from a layer two perspective, but all the latest silicon can now do not only layer two, but can also do what's called VXLAN routing as well. Right? The question really then becomes of a control plane, if you're going to adopt it, right? Head identification has its benefits. It's very simple, easy to configure, very low maintenance. Or if you want to really scale it out, you want to do multi-tenant data centers, then there is great value in the EVPN model. Right. But it's not a case of one or the other, it's a case of based on your environment, we're seeing different people using different ones, right? A lot of the adoption of EVPN seems to be that I, ha I know BGP, I want to interact with third parties, I want to interrupt between different vendors, so I, I go down the BG EVPN route. Right? But it's, it's one or the other, right? It's, not, it's, not, it's really up to your choice. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Hi, Erasmus from Stockholm IX. Uh, you mentioned BGP UCMP in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work on Jericho. Sorry? That doesn't work on Jericho. ECMP doesn't work on Jericho? No, UCMP. Yeah, it does now. No. Does it work on any platforms? It works on Jericho line? now. Oh, since which version? Yes. Uh, 420. Ah. <laughs> Now-ish. Yeah, now-ish, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. So, any more questions? Just time for one more. Uh, Tor Andersson, Red Pill Impro. Uh, I wonder about scaling. Imagine you have a data center, traditional uh, multi chassis lag type data center with, I don't know, 1,500 VLANs. Is it feasible to actually rip out all those VLAN trunks and um, just go to a model where you actually do? EVPN from the top of racks or between the top of racks for all of those VLANs um, or do you run into scaling issues then? In terms of, so where are we starting? Uh, no, layer let's, two let's say we or? have a, a layer two, traditional layer yep. two data center with uh, say 1500 VLANs mm -hmm. spread across X amount of racks and so on. And, <coughs> and you know, layer two trunks between the top of racks and, and the course. Yeah, yeah. Right. So is it feasible to actually rip out all of that layer two connectivity, as in, in the underlay, and build a uh, EVPN data center with all of these VXLANs between the top of rack switches? 
or, or will will this break down if you actually approach say a thousand, two thousand? No, I mean this is, is it perfectly scalable to do this, right? I mean, but classically, if you had that Wabbit's term uh, access core distribution network, what you would normally do is just build on parallel the least spine, and obviously do some sort of VLAN handoff as you transition those VLANs off. But the point being, at some point in time, the VLANs would terminate at the top of the rack, and then you would just carry everything. If you wish to use, you would use eVPN, right? So the point being here is you have a single control plane carrying all those different tenants. Great. Okay. So to answer in summary, yes. I mean, that's the goal of the, the protocol. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, we've reached uh, the time for this presentation. Could you join me again in thanking Alex, please? <laughs>